When lugging a heavy torpedo, a Type 97's 225-litre outboard tanks couldn't be filled in any case, meaning that only Tomonaga's starboard 350-litre inboard tank could be fueled. He probably wouldn't have enough gas to make it home from the mission. Several of the pilots requested that they take the damaged bird instead. But Tomonaga cheerfully declined, joking that the Yankees were only 90 miles away and that he could make it there and back again on just a single tank. The pilot briefing was delivered personally by Admiral Yamaguchi. He encouraged his men to do their utmost. They were truly the last hope for the force. Knowing that there were three American carriers out there, and that one had been hit already, it was absolutely imperative that they attack one of the undamaged American vessels. The men nodded grimly and started making their way to their waiting aircraft. Yamaguchi was clearly moved by the sacrifice of Hiryu's Hikotaicho. As Tomonaga turned to mount his aircraft, Yamaguchi moved to shake his hand. Solemnly, he told the lieutenant, I will gladly follow you. To the men standing nearby, it seemed clear that the admiral had no intention of returning alive from this battle if men like Tomonaga were already making the ultimate sacrifice for their country. At around 1.15pm, while Tomonaga's unit was still being briefed, the first of Kobayashi's dive bombers began returning. Finding the flight deck already spotted, one of them buzzed the ship and dropped a message, which Commander Kawaguchi Susumu, Hiryu's Hikocho, retrieved. According to the note, the attack force had left the enemy force at a bearing of 080 degrees and 90 miles distant. It was composed of five heavy cruisers and a carrier, the latter burning heavily. Kawaguchi entrusted this information to Lieutenant Hashimoto, not knowing that Tomonaga's backseater would not be with him on this flight. Thus, Tomonaga was not in possession of the most current information on Yorktown's location as he started his mission. At last, all was in readiness. Hiryu began launching at 1.30pm, watched intently by every man fortunate enough to be topside. None was more attentive than Admiral Yamaguchi, who stood gazing solemnly as the aircraft went up one by one. Hiryu's final strike force assembled, wheeled and made their way toward the eastern horizon. Win or lose, it was all down to this. Near at hand, Captain Kaku was already giving orders to begin landing Kobayashi's aircraft. After recovering from them, Hiryu would swing out of the wind and take up a northerly course, intending to converge with Nagara and Nagumo. When Tomonaga was on his way, Commander Kawaguchi cleared the deck and recovered aircraft. First to come down was Soryu's Type 2 recon bird, followed by the remnants of the dive bomber strike force of the 24 aircraft Hiryu had sent aloft with Kobayashi at 10.57am. Just six were landing now, five Kanbaku and a zero. The fighter and one of the Kanbaku were both shot up to such a degree as to be unserviceable. Lieutenants Kobayashi and Kondo were not among the returning aircraft. The details of the mission were difficult to discern from the survivors, their accounts didn't jibe terribly well. As such, Hiryu's officers found it difficult to piece together a cohesive account from the men until long after the battle was actually over. Kobayashi's mission seemed to have started out well enough. After launching, the strike force had proceeded at relatively low altitude because the visibility seemed better, though they climbed as they got closer to the suspected location of the American fleet. Then, at 11.32 a.m. had come the welcome signal from Chikuma No. 5 that would guide the attack birds to the target, followed by Hiryu's own message ten minutes later, rebroadcasting the location of the Americans. However, at about the same time, Kobayashi's bombers had lost their fighter cover. Lieutenant Shigematsu's Zeros spotted what appeared to be enemy torpedo aircraft below and ahead of them. He asked for and received permission to engage them. In retrospect, this was clearly a mistake, indulging in a taste for combat against enemy aircraft that were of no immediate threat to Hiryu was a poor reason to forego close support of Kobayashi's precious bombers. Yet this was typical for Japanese fighters, who had not yet begun to internalise the fundamental truth that close support was the only kind of support that really mattered. Diving down with his six zeros, Shigematsu had encountered not enemy torpedo bomber Douglas, but Lieutenant Charles Ware's doomed flight of Enterprise Scout Bomber Douglas. The ensuing affray had been sharp, 
The Japanese made numerous passes at the Dauntless S, but discovered for themselves what many of their combat air patrol compatriots had already learned earlier in the morning. American dive bombers were formidable opponents when they flew in close formation. The Zeros were rudely surprised by the hot reception they got. In fact, they succeeded in shooting down none of the scout bomber Douglas. However, two Kanzan, Warrant Officer Minagishi Yoshijiro and Petty Officer First Class Sasaki Hitoshi, were damaged severely enough in return that they had to break off the fight and limp back to Hiryu. In the end, only Minagishi's Zero managed to make it back, just in time to be turned around for Tomonaga's outbound strike mission. Sasaki was forced to ditch near one of Hiryu's escorts at about 12.30pm. It was thus a rather chastened Shigematsu who led his surviving quartet of Zeros back in pursuit of Kobayashi's force, which had gone on ahead. As it developed, Shigematsu's fighters were not available to Kobayashi when it counted most. At 11.52 a.m., Yorktown's radar had detected an unknown flight of aircraft coming in. Her radar operator was one of the best in the business, and he managed to coax from his rather primitive equipment the fact that these aircraft were in the process of climbing, something friendly aircraft looking to land would never have done. The American Combat Air Patrol had just been in the process of rotating. However, Yorktown had 20 fighters up, and radar gave them time enough, barely, to send the majority to intercept Kobayashi. Even so, the Wildcats didn't have time to gain sufficient altitude, nor were they properly formed up, forcing them to attack singly or in small groups. Kobayashi's formation was arrayed in a right echelon of two chutai, each formed into its own V of three shutai. Kobayashi sighted the enemy carrier at noon and promptly sent a message to Hiryu, announcing that he was attacking. Almost immediately thereafter, though, the Kanbaku unit had been set upon by American fighters coming in from below and ahead. The Americans had pressed their attacks boldly. One wildcat, piloted by Lieutenant Elbert S. McCuskey, took one run against the formation, came around for a second pass, and found itself facing Yamashita's second chutai almost head-on. Like a hawk hitting a flock of pigeons, McCuskey blew Yamashita's formation apart. Several Japanese pilots were forced to break ranks to avoid being rammed by his wildcat. Meanwhile, Kobayashi's lead chutai had been similarly thrown into confusion. As soon as the Japanese formation had broken, a fresh group of American fighters had charged into their heart, firing with great precision. Several kanbaku had gone down in flames almost immediately, including the leader of the second chutai, Lieutenant Kondo. Lieutenant Arthur J. Brassfield single-handedly annihilated a shotai of bombers that made it out of the melee and attempted to break toward Yorktown. Another pair was forced to jettison their bombs. In several cases, the nimble Type 99s tried manoeuvring onto the tails of the American Wildcats, although this tactic had met with little success. It was around this time that Shigematsu's Zeros finally rejoined the battle. It was a good thing too, as new elements of Grumman's were continually appearing on the scene. Thereupon Shigematsu's quartet had a furious exchange with the American Wildcats, whose pilots were more than willing to mix it up with their opposite numbers. The results were again sharply unpleasant for the Japanese, with three of Shigematsu's men shot down for only a single Grumman bagged in return. The doughty Shigematsu was the only survivor. Finally, at about 12.10pm, the remaining seven armed Kanbaku had begun their attack runs on Yorktown, a fact that one of their number, perhaps Lieutenant Nakayama, had thereupon signalled to Hiryu. The coherence of their original formation long since destroyed, the Japanese bombers were forced to attack singly or in small groups. Before them lay the American task force. The enemy flat top had been closely guarded by a tight ring of cruisers and destroyers, each of which could contribute to the defence of the carrier in the centre. The Japanese had come in from directions ranging across half the compass, peeling into sharp, precise dives. Just as the men of Kido Butai had been forced to give grudging admiration to the technique of Enterprises and Yorktown's dive bombers two hours earlier, so too the men on Yorktown were aware that they were watching seasoned professionals in action. The Japanese pilots attacked coolly and deliberately, holding their dives to the absolute limit while displaying an utter disdain for the ferocious anti-aircraft fire being directed back at them, 
These men were all part of Nagumo's A-team that had been held in reserve from the morning strike against Midway. The results of their attack on Yorktown proved that their admiral's faith in them had been well deserved. The first Type 99 had attacked from directly astern, holding his dive to the last possible second. In fact, to several observers, it appeared that this particular pilot had no intention of pulling out at all. However, contemptuous as Japanese Kanbaku pilots were of anti-aircraft fire, the immutable truth was that American flak was intense and accurate. The 1.1-inch machine guns located aft of Yorktown's island summarily chopped this particular bomber into pieces, just as it released its weapon, a 242-kilogram high-explosive bomb intended for flak suppression. The smashed Kanbaku fell in three sections into the carrier's wake. Nevertheless, this pilot had aimed his weapon with great skill. Tumbling end over end, the bomb hit Yorktown just abaft her midship's elevator, detonating in a bright flash. It was almost as if the unknown pilot was exacting a posthumous retribution as his bomb slaughtered the 1.1-inch crews who had just shot him down. Despite the ship's temporarily lessened firepower, Hiryu's second dive bomber was given exactly the same treatment. Diving along a similar line from astern, his kanbaku was blown into pieces by flak and fell headlong into the ship's wake. The detonation of his high-explosive bomb peppered Yorktown's stern with fragments and started some incidental fires on the fantail. The third attacker, the last man from the first Chutai, was Petty Officer Second Class Tsuchiya Takayoshi. Approaching from astern as well, Tsuchiya held a steep 75-degree dive down to low level and secured what appeared to be a hit with his semi-armor-piercing bomb. In fact, though, he planted it close alongside the carrier's stern. Tsuchiya avoided the fate of his two comrades and managed to scoot away at wave-top height. Next came four aircraft from the second Chutai. They attacked in an arc across Yorktown's starboard beam. Yorktown, though, was a difficult target to hit, manoeuvring as she was at thirty knots. Almost as soon as the second Chutai started coming in, she began executing a turn to port to throw off their aim. The next attacker was Petty Officer First Class Matsumoto Sadao, who began angling in almost immediately after Tsuchiya's run. Coming in slightly less steeply than Tsuchiya, he thought he secured a hit on the elusive carrier's stern. Yet he too had actually dropped his high-explosive bomb in Yorktown's wake. However, Yorktown's luck had finally run out as the next Kanbaku headed in. This bird was piloted by Warrant Officer Nakazawa Iwao, in whose back seat rode Special Service Ensign Nakayama Shimamatsu, leader of the second Shatai. Nakazawa dove steeply from about 8,000 feet. His aim was true, and despite the heavy fire being thrown up by Yorktown and her escorts, he planted his 250-kilogram semi-armor-piercing bomb directly amidships. Immediately, Yorktown began belching enormous clouds of thick black smoke. Heavily damaged, her speed began dropping noticeably, which decreased her ability to fend off the next attack. This was delivered by Warrant Officer Nakagawa Shizuo, the leader of the second Chutai's third Shotai. Taking a new tack, he came in on Yorktown's starboard bow from about 7,500 feet. Whether the enemy carrier was distracted by Nakazawa's hit, or her gunners were just less observant in this particular direction, his aircraft benefited from much reduced anti-aircraft fire. Nakagawa also eschewed normal dive-bombing technique in favour of glide-bombing. He could have taught Lofton Henderson's men a thing or two about this overlooked attack method, as he slung his 250 kg bomb almost directly on top of the carrier's forward elevator. Yorktown took a heavy hit, with the several fires resulting from this bomb threatening both the ship's magazine and its forward aviation gasoline stores. However, unlike Japanese carriers, the American flattop had protected herself better from her own avgas system. A fueling bowser that was on the flight deck before the attack had been unceremoniously consigned to the drink to remove its flammable contents from any possibility of harming the ship. More important, Yorktown's personnel had earlier drained her fuel lines and flooded them with inert carbon dioxide gas. This was the first usage of this recent damage control innovation. Yorktown's experience in earlier battles was showing, and it paid handsome dividends.
Had Yorktown been forced to fight a major Avgas fire at this juncture, with six of her nine boilers already knocked offline, Nakagawa's hit could well have been fatal. As it was, however, her damage was manageable. The seventh and last aircraft to dive was that of Petty Officer First Class Seo Tetsuo, Nakazawa's wingman. Pushing over from about 8,000 feet, Seo aimed at the carrier's starboard beam. His dive was somewhat shallower than many of those that had preceded it. Whether the clouds of smoke billowing from Yorktown threw off his aim, or his dive simply needed a little steepening, Seo suffered a near miss close aboard Yorktown's side. All in all, Hiryu's pilots had executed a superlative attack. Seven aircraft had secured three direct hits and two very near misses, an enviable rate of accuracy in anyone's book. Not only that, but judging by the smoke emanating from the target and her rapidly decreasing headway, the carrier appeared to be heavily, perhaps fatally hit. Lieutenant Kobayashi would have been proud of his men. The commander of Hiryu's Kanbaku unit, however, did not survive the attack. None of his aviators had seen what happened to him, despite the fact that he had lived through the initial fracas with the American Grummans. Indeed, it is clear that Kobayashi himself had witnessed Tsuchiya's initial hit on the target, because it was he who had broadcast at 12.11pm, message number two. Fires break out on carrier, yet when the attack was over, Kobayashi had simply disappeared. The five survivors from Hiryu's decimated group had thereafter made their way home without any of their senior leaders. Ensign Nakayama was now the sole surviving officer of what had once been one of the finest dive-bomber squadrons in the Imperial Navy. They had truly given their all, but would it be enough? The outcome of Kobayashi's attack, in conjunction with the sighting reports from Soryu's speedy D-4Y, should have given Yamaguchi and Nagumo shortly thereafter final, conclusive evidence that it was now time to break off the day's action and begin falling back on the main body. Both sides could do grade school arithmetic. After debriefing Kobayashi's aviators, Yamaguchi would have known that he had hit an enemy carrier, but only one. That carrier was out of action, but whether it was in danger of sinking was unknown. Kobayashi's squadron had been gutted in the process, yet two other American carriers remained unfought. If closing the range with the Americans had been questionable after Kobayashi's launch, even with Nagumo's surface group pushed ahead in the van, it was doubly so now. Indeed, Yamaguchi should have been able to divine at least three good reasons for advising Nagumo to break off offensive air activities immediately. First, even if Tomonaga's outbound group did achieve some results, it would likely be at the expense of most or all of his remaining aircraft. The relationship between the application of marginal force and taking disproportionate casualties was well known. If Hiryu's 18 dive bombers had been chopped to pieces attacking a single enemy carrier, 10 of the more vulnerable torpedo planes were likely to fare much worse in any subsequent strike against a pair of them. Second, even if Tomonaga did achieve results against another enemy carrier, Hiryu would likely be in no position to exploit his success in any event. With her air power caught in a downward spiral, Hiryu's subsequent strikes could only be weaker. The truth was that at this point in the battle, Hiryu was really no longer in a position to tackle anything more formidable than a target barge. With the remnants of Kido Butai's combat air patrol still overhead, she might have the ability to defend herself for a time, but she really had no offensive firepower left. This leads directly to the third good reason for disengaging. In the absence of any real offensive capability, the preservation of an extremely valuable carrier for use in future operations should have taken precedence over trying to pull off a miracle. It certainly should have taken precedence over anyone's sense of personal honour. Given these same odds, an American commander's reaction would most likely have been to cut his losses and run for it, forthrightly and without embarrassment. Even granting that the ultimate power of decision lay with Nagumo, Yamaguchi had every reason to advise his superior that now looked like a good time to get out while the getting was good. He had certainly never been shy in making suggestions to his superior before this supremely important moment. Now would have been a good time to reinforce his reputation for outspokenness. However, Japanese admirals operated according to an entirely different martial calculus. Even before the cataclysmic 10.20am attack, 
Nagumo had clearly wanted to engage the Americans in a surface battle. Now that the battle had turned against them, Yamaguchi saw no reason to modify that stance. Instead of being the centerpiece of his fleet, Hiryu was now just a disposable component. Yamaguchi would continue closing with his commander's flagship, which had the effect of trailing his own coattails in front of the enemy and increasing Hiryu's danger measurably every minute. The Americans, meanwhile, were trying their best to recover from Kobayashi's attack. Yorktown was crippled, drifting, with thick clouds of black smoke trailing from her innards. Her fires were serious, with damage control parties busy in several places below decks. Down in her engine spaces, workmen were trying their best to bring at least some of her boilers back online, despite the damage to her uptakes. Yorktown's flight deck was also holed from bomb hits, and crews were scurrying to jury rig patches using wooden beams and steel plates to cover her wounds. All in all, she was a mess, with her radar disabled and her command spaces bathed in smoke, Admiral Fletcher rightly decided to transfer his flag to heavy cruiser Astoria. A whaleboat was brought alongside, and Fletcher made the trip over to the cruiser, arriving at 1.24pm. Hornet and Enterprise were thus left with the task of recovering their own attack aircraft and those of Yorktown, many of which were still dribbling back from the morning's operations. Not only that, but they would have to put combat air patrol assets not only over Task Force 16, but over Yorktown as well. Enterprise sent up additional fighters at 12.35pm. But by 12.58pm, Yorktown's fighters were showing up at her sister's doorstep, looking for a place to land. For her part, Hornet had completed landing her own scout bomber Douglas at 12.09pm. While Kobayashi was attacking, she too had found Yorktown wildcats needing to land and duly brought them down. In the process, though, one of Thatch's morning strike escorts, carrying a wounded pilot, had landed hard enough to trigger its machine guns. The resulting spray of .50 calibre fire riddled the deck park forward and killed five men, including the son of a prominent United States admiral. As soon as she had cleared her decks from the latest fiasco of her miserable day, the last of her own combat air patrol fighters needed to be brought on board. Thus, Hornet was occupied with recovery and launch operations from around noon until 1.29pm. On board Enterprise, Admiral Spruance was, for all intents and purposes, on his own. Seeing a towering column of smoke rising on the horizon as the result of the attack on Yorktown, he had promptly dispatched the heavy cruisers Pensacola and Vincennes and destroyers Balch and Benham to assist Fletcher's flagship. Yet with Fletcher currently bobbing around in Astoria's whaleboat, the senior American admiral was unable to assert any control over the battle. His subordinate, Spruance, was in the dark. He still had no clear idea where the remaining enemy carrier or carriers were located, and until he did, he couldn't order further strikes. As Hiryu continued charging to the east, her three stricken compatriots were entering new stages of extremis. The fires had been blazing on Akagi, Kaga and Soryu for several hours now, and the ships were beginning to suffer permanent structural damage as a result. On board Akagi and Kaga, which each had an elevator that had been dropped into its well, the situation would have been aggravated because the elevator shafts began acting like chimneys, venting smoke at the top and sucking air in through the bottom. The effect was to create a blast furnace. Steel structural members, having been heated too hot and for too long, were now glowing red and beginning to come apart under the strain. Even the incredibly sturdy, riveted construction of the carrier's hulls and hangar decks could not withstand the combination of weakening frames being hammered by induced explosions. Under such circumstances, large chunks of the carriers, some weighing dozens of tons, were simply being blown overboard. Inside, the bulkheads in the vicinity of the fires were now mostly bare, red-hot metal, the chalky sodium-silicate fireproof paint having been either flaked off in handfuls by the explosions or scorched away by the flames. The aircraft in the hangars had long since been melted down to aluminum slag, leaving only the glowing steel engine blocks deposited on the hangar decks. Not surprisingly, almost the entirety of the hangars on board both Kaga and Soryu had long since been abandoned to the fires. On Akagi, though, the struggle continued. The fact that she had managed to rig a pump on the bow helped matters, 
but it really only delayed the inevitable. Without the possibility of restoring power, and thereby vastly increasing her pumping capacity, she couldn't make any headway against the fires. Aoki essentially acknowledged this when, at 1.38pm, he ordered the Emperor's portrait transferred to Nowaki. The Imperial visage was sent over the side and into a waiting launch to make its way to Nowaki. It was doubtless clutched to the chest of some unknown officer, who would have perforce accompanied it to the bottom if an accident or misstep had cast him into the sea. Thus was Aoki's primary responsibility to the Emperor absolved. It remained now only for the captain to share the fate of his ship, whatever that might be. Akagi continued her grim circling. Even as Akagi's engines persisted in their mysterious activities, Kaga's machinery was finally closing down for good. Though she had been crawling northwest for some time now, between 12.50pm and 1pm she ground to a halt. This final loss of power, and with it any hope of real damage control, led to the conclusion that it was time to transfer His Majesty's portrait to a safer venue. At 1.25pm, it was transferred to one of Hagikaze's boats standing by the anchor deck. Meanwhile, at about the same time, Kaga's commanding officer, Commander Amagai, had apparently gotten himself back on board his blazing ship, most likely on the anchor deck as well. Despite the common wisdom on the matter, there is, in fact, considerable ambiguity concerning whether or not Amagai was, or even believed himself to be, in command of the burning carrier. He had jumped from Kaga's boat deck earlier, yet Kaga had remained underway, and apparently nominally under command, during his time in the water or on Hagikaze. Someone, and it wasn't Amagai, must have made the decision to remove the Emperor's portrait, and possibly ordered her engines shut down as well. Lieutenant Kunisada mentions in his account that the Chief Damage Control Officer, the head of the First Damage Control Section, was apparently directing matters from the Kaga's forecastle. If this is true, then he, and not Amagai, was most likely the acting commanding officer of Kaga in the period from 1pm to her final abandonment. Indeed, Amagai himself made the rather curious statement regarding his ordering the men over the side and then joining them. He said that he made the decision believing that the skilled flyers, who could not be replaced, should be saved so that they could have another chance of fighting. At the same time, I thought that the fate of the ship would be better left to her skipper or the second command officer in case he was killed. The implication is that Amagai did not believe he was in command, nor was he certain that Captain Okada had even been killed. That Amagai subsequently filed the report on her loss only indicates that by then it had finally been ascertained that he was, in fact, her senior surviving officer. But there's no evidence to show that Amagai actually knew this at the time, with Kaga now dead in the water, though, whoever was in charge decided that it was time to get the engineers out of the lower spaces. A messenger was sent below to the engine rooms to tell them to evacuate and come topside. However, he could not get through. Some of them must have abandoned their posts, though, for the Black Gang was not entirely wiped out. However, 213 of her nominal complement of 323 engineers ultimately perished, including her chief engineer, Commander Utsumi Hachiro. It's reasonable to imagine that many of them were either already dead by the time they were ordered to evacuate, or were trapped below with no hope of escape. Their terrible fates can only be imagined as the fires finally worked their way down into the great ship's innards. At about the same time, Lieutenant Kunisada was in a bind. After the enormous explosions in the hangar, he had finally come to his senses to find himself lying on the hangar deck. Standing up in the smoky darkness, he had realised that he was near the midship's elevator and could see some light coming down the well. He made for the command spaces. Whether by chance or design, though, he never reached the command spaces at all and instead found himself fighting the fires on the lower hangar deck level, near a midships. Eventually, Kunisada found himself in the petty officers' quarters. Inside, he found two engineering personnel taking shelter from the fire. Kunisada ordered one of them to open the porthole in the space, and the compartment immediately became bright with sunlight. He then shouted, Maintenance officer is here. All section men come here to me. Gather in this light. Eventually, a total of eight men then showed up, half of whom were injured. Several were streaming blood, 
and all were already weary and darkened with smoke. One of them was the chief of the third emergency section of damage control personnel. This man erroneously told Kunisada that their mutual commander, the chief damage control officer, and all his subordinates had been killed or wounded. He himself was the only man remaining from the third section. Kunisada thus believed himself Kaga's senior damage control officer. The third section man was despondent and urged Kunisada to give in to the inevitable. Come, he said, let's go share the commander's fate. He then turned to make his way back to the hangar so as to seek death in battle. Kunisada restrained him suddenly. The fire flared up near the entrance to the compartment, surprising the men inside. They slammed the porthole shut and tried to put out the fire, but the air quality worsened precipitously and breathing became difficult. There was no longer any way out, and Kunisada wondered if their fates were now sealed as a last resort. He ordered all the men to clamber out of the porthole. As it happened, the anti-torpedo bulge on Kaga's hull formed a sort of shelf in this section of the vessel. It was wide enough for them to stand on. Their perch was none too safe. Hanging above them and somewhat astern were the large gun tubs for the five-inch anti-aircraft mounts. Unfortunately, the shell hoists for the guns were burning, and the shells in the hoists were detonating periodically. Ammunition for the machine guns was also cooking off farther astern, sending bullets whizzing about every so often. Visibility was rotten. They couldn't see the bow because of the bulk of the ship's funnel, and the stern was out of sight behind the fires. One of Kunisada's party slipped off the bulge and plunged into the water. Someone threw him a line, and they all grabbed hold, but the parties, injured or simply exhausted, failed to hold on and sank vertically into the sea. The water was so clear that they could see his white uniform shimmering below the surface as he slowly sank into the depths. It was a most depressing moment and brought home their isolation. Still, their precarious ledge was better than what lay waiting for them on board the ship, so there they huddled, waiting for whatever came next. Kunisada's men were not the only ones to have exited the blazing ship via her portholes. In the ship's sick bay, the senior medical man present was an ensign. There was no sign of the ship's surgeon. Knowing that the sick bay was cut off from the rest of the ship by the fires, the ensign sent a runner named Okamoto out to look for an escape route. However, none could be found. When Okamoto reported this to his superior, the officer simply said, Many thanks for your good efforts, and sat back resignedly to face death. The decks around were getting hot, and the paint on the overheads was beginning to smolder and burn. However, at this juncture, another one of the men, a senior petty officer, noticed the portholes. Hurriedly, he, Okamoto, and the other orderlies moved everyone they could including all of the wounded strong enough to make it out through the portholes. Unlike Kunisada's party, though, there was no torpedo bulge immediately below their perch. From the sick bay it was a straight jump into the ocean. In they went, all except the petty officer who had discerned the escape route. He himself was too stout to fit through. Thus he stayed behind, along with those too badly injured to move, to await the fate that would not be long in coming. Kaga's final demise might well have come at about this time, had it not been for a rather incredible stroke of luck, with the carrier having now ground to a stop, the Nautilus was finally given the rewards of her dogged pursuit. Kaga now lay motionless in front of Lieutenant Commander William Brockman's boat. He noted two cruisers escorting what he tentatively identified as a Soryu class carrier. To the United States skipper, the stricken carrier appeared to be on an even keel and the hull appeared to be undamaged. There were no flames, and the fire seemed to be under control, although her topsides were already clearly demolished. Brockman also noted that the men on her bow seemed to be trying to rig her for towing. Brockman chose an approach course to attack her starboard side. Finally, at 1.59pm, he let fly with four torpedoes at his helpless target, firing from somewhat astern at a track angle of 125 degrees. The range to the target was 2,700 yards. Brockman kept his scope up and noted the somewhat disconcerting fact that the wakes of the torpedoes were observed through the periscope until the torpedoes struck the target. Not surprisingly, the fact that Brockman could see the wakes meant that the Japanese could see them as well.
It wouldn't take much guessing for Karga's escorts to determine from which direction the attack had come. Lieutenant Kunisada saw the fish coming in. From his perch on Karga's flank, the torpedo tracks stretched toward him like accusatory fingers. Yelling to the men around him to jump and swim for their lives, Kunisada leaped into the water, the others belatedly followed suit, and everyone swam madly away from Karga. Lieutenant Commander Mitoya, likewise, saw the torpedoes heading for him and could do nothing but hold his breath. Anyone in the water anywhere near the thunderous impact was as good as dead in any case. In a war that would be replete with examples of faulty United States torpedoes, Brockman's attack was destined to be one of the crown jewels. The first of his four fish malfunctioned and never left the tube. Two others ran errantly, one missing Karga astern, the other missing ahead. The fourth and final torpedo ran hot and true, aimed dead amidships, but when it struck Karga's heavy hull, its contact exploder was either faulty or was crushed by the impact, a common failing of United States submarine torpedoes at the time. There was no explosion. Instead, the fish broke in half, sending the warhead to the bottom and leaving the air flask and tail assembly bobbing in the water. The men already swimming nearby greeted the scene with a mixture of rage and incredulous relief. Some of the sailors quickly seized on the unexpected life raft in their midst, but no one was happy with it. Several shouted curses and pounded it with their fists. It was just the latest abuse heaped on them on a morning already filled with more than their share of terror. Oddly enough, Nautilus's skipper came away with a much different impression of the attack's results. Brockman reported that red flames appeared along the length of the ship from the bow to midships. The fire which had first attracted us and was nearly extinguished broke out. Boats drew away from the bow and many men were seen going over the side. Cruisers began reversing course at high speed and started to echo range. This is a vivid description and more than a little puzzling. It is no wonder that some have found Nautilus's sinking claim hard to dismiss, although it is incontrovertible that Karga remained afloat. Brockman was also correct that the cruisers were now gunning for his submarine, destroyer Hagikaze, which had been off Karga's starboard quarter at the time of the attack, swung to starboard and went to high speed to close. Commander Iwagami Juichi immediately began laying down depth charges. Captain Brockman's report confirms the ferocity and speed of the first attack. At 2.10pm, Hagikaze went thrashing directly overhead, and Brockman quickly reversed course and crash-dived to 300 feet. Eleven depth charges splashed into the water at 2.22pm and detonated with unpleasant results. Brockman noted that this entire barrage was close and well-placed, except that the charges were set too shallow and exploded above the ship. A few small leaks sprung in the submarine, Iwagami's first run had been good, and he lost no time in making another at 2.30pm, which came even closer. Nautilus's sound operator reported the noise of propellers all around the dial, making it likely that Mikazi had also joined in the counterattack. Karga's destroyers subjected Nautilus to a brutal ordeal for the next two hours, and came within an ace of sinking the American submarine, when two of their depth charges evidently clanged against the sub at 340 feet, but did not explode. Despite this close call, after enduring 42 depth charges, Brockman was eventually able to sneak away from his attacker, though he judged it unsafe to return to periscope depth till 4.10pm. Though Brockman opined that the Japanese broke off their attack too soon, he was understandably thankful that they had, as his battery was nearly exhausted. The actual damage to his old boat, however, proved negligible. All in all, though, Nautilus had made a well-earned escape after a day of aggressive attacks against the enemy. If the final prize of her efforts eluded her, it certainly was not for lack of trying. Lieutenant Kunisada could observe little of the hunt for Nautilus from his current position. Now that he was in the water, he had no choice but to continue swimming. Many men were drifting about with him. Looking back at the ship towering high above him, he could see that her damage was severe but localised. Her upper works were ablaze, with dull red fires visible through the many rents at her side. Heat shimmered off the metal, but the worst of the fires seemed to be dying down for the moment. The smoke coming from the ship was no longer oily black, but a lighter brown colour. Kunisada could see, too, 
that the bridge had been crushed by the explosion that had killed Captain Okada. There were deep rents in Kaga's side, particularly on the starboard side aft of the funnel, and on the port side forward, some of these gashes ran nearly all the way to the waterline. Yet Kaga's lower hull was remarkably intact. Despite her wounds, she still impressed the damage control officer with her bulk and seeming stability. On both the bow and stern, he could see sailors clustered and firefighting efforts continued. While in the water, Kunisada encountered a communications man named Oda, who was still clutching a sheaf of Kaga's messages in one hand while trying to swim. Oda was wounded in the leg and was bleeding. Kunisada, though impressed by the man's devotion to duty, nevertheless told him to throw the damned messages away and concentrate on saving himself. Oda responded to this direct order with relief, throwing the papers into the sea, finding a piece of lumber, the two men hung on. They tried swimming toward the ship's stern, but either currents or wave action made this impossible, and they eventually gave up. They would not be picked up for several more hours, finally crawling on board Hagikaze at about 4pm. Warrant Officer Yoshino Haruo, Kaga's reconnaissance flight leader, was in the water by now as well. Having made his escape from the flight deck shortly after the carrier was bombed, he had managed to pick his way down to the stern. He had found Kaga's boat deck packed with survivors. As soon as Kaga lost power, he noticed a destroyer, probably Hagikaze edging up to her stern, and decided to swim out to her. Into the water he went, along with many other men. However, all of a sudden, the destroyer turned about and disappeared, most likely in response to Nautilus's attack. Now Yoshino's case was worse, and he didn't know if he could survive. In the end, though, Hagikaze returned, and he managed to make it on board about the same time Kunisada did. As he came dripping out of the water and onto the deck, he unexpectedly met a relative who served on the tin can. Deeply shamed by his appearance, and at having been defeated in battle, Yoshino nevertheless accepted dry clothes from the man. He hoped that his relation would not tell everybody at home about his pitiable condition. Wounded torpedo bomber pilot Maida Takeshi also made it on board. Like Yoshino, he had gone into the water as soon as Hagikaze had started to edge in. In fact, he had been bodily thrown into the water by other men on the fantail. Seeing Hagikaze putting out her boats, they had assumed that any of the less severely wounded would be better off being picked up and taken to safety on the destroyer than waiting around on Kaga, where no medical attention could be provided. Upon Hagikaze's abrupt exit from the scene, however, Maida's hoped-for rescue evaporated, and his shipmate's intended kindness now placed him in grave danger. He had a life jacket, but he kept swallowing seawater in the long swells, and occasionally, as he surged to the tops of the waves, he could see Soryu burning in the distance. Finally, Hagikaze returned this time with knotted ropes lowered along both her flanks. Pulled out of the cold water, Maida was in deep shock from both exposure and the bomb splinter still lodged in his leg. He wasn't feeling any pain. In fact, he found that he could walk on his wounded limb, despite having a smashed femur. When the shock wore off later, such a thing would have been unthinkable. His flight boots were long gone, and the hot cartridges from the destroyer's 25 mounts were everywhere underfoot, they made sizzling sounds when his wet socks struck them, burning his feet. The young ship's doctor was too busy to attend to him properly. There was no anaesthetic, and he'd already run out of bandages. He merely splashed iodine solution on Maida's open wound. The pain was absolutely excruciating, but Maida managed to keep his composure. Later, he would credit the cooler seawater and the iodine for saving his limb from gangrene, his abbreviated treatment at an end. The aviator slumped down on the deck to stare at Kaga. To Maida, the situation was beyond caring about, beyond any sort of reflection. He was just 21 years old, and his life as an aviator had been dangerous enough in peacetime. In wartime, it was more dangerous than almost anything. He knew that he was expendable. He'd been treated as such, treated like a rag. He didn't resent it. It was what he expected so Maida couldn't really comprehend the big picture of what losing this battle might mean to Japan, or its ability to win the war. He couldn't even consider what the future might bring. There was no future. There wasn't even a tomorrow. There was only the present moment. He was safe enough for the time being, but he was exhausted, 
He was famished, and his leg hurt like hell. Kaga continued burning. In the sea next to the blazing Soryu, Gunnery Officer Kanao had now been drifting on his ladder for some time, but his movement relative to the ship was almost imperceptible. However, without his being aware of it, he had gradually begun to pull abreast of the anchor deck. Suddenly, somebody yelled down to him from above, Look, there's the gunnery officer! Looking up from his piece of flotsam, Canal saw a sailor fasten a rope to the guardrail and rappel down. Grabbing the gunnery officer, the sailor and Canal were soon hauled back up on deck. As they reached the top, many hands pulled them back over the railing. Canal felt like a zombie. Half dead and half alive, the sailors on the deck embraced him, cheering, Gunnery officer is alive! Banzai to our gunnery officer, huddled on the anchor deck, Canal found some forty or fifty men who had either not heard the order to abandon ship or who preferred to take their chances here rather than in the water. Canal slumped exhausted onto one of the anchor chains, utterly unable to move, nearby, two or three. Sailors hauled out a box and broke it open. Inside were canned peaches. One of the sailors opened a can with his knife and handed it to Canal, saying, Help yourself, gunnery officer. Canal thanked him, but hesitated to take it. And there is enough for all of us, the sailor assured him, and continued passing out the cans to the others on the bow. Famished, Canal consumed everything in the tin. The taste of the sweet fruit and nectar was indescribably delicious. Canal couldn't remember ever having eaten anything tastier. Aft of their sanctuary on the bow, Soryu continued burning and fuming. It was 2 p.m., and Cruiser Tone wasn't doing anything to improve her reputation for untimely floatplane launches. Now, some 45 minutes after Admiral Abe had ordered the second set of recon birds aloft, Tone finally managed to send up her number three and number four planes. The reason for the delay is unclear. Her number three aircraft, a Type 95, should have been ready to take off at short notice. It is possible that her number four plane was still being turned around from the morning's flight. Whether Petty Officer Amari was in command again is unclear, but it seems likely that he was. Just as with Kobayashi's earlier attack, Yamaguchi hadn't yet heard back from Tomonaga's flight. This wasn't really a cause for concern yet, as the Hikotaicho had only been gone for half an hour and would likely need another half hour to find the enemy. Sure enough, at 2.26pm, Lieutenant Tomonaga came on the air to order his strike planes into attack formation. A few minutes later, Hiryu intercepted a simple, suggestive order from the flight leader. Zengun Totsugeki, all forces attack. Clearly, Tomonaga's flight was about to go into battle. Almost at the same time, Haruna's number one aircraft announced that he was under attack by American fighters and that he suspected American carriers were in the area. Yamaguchi might have thought that this transmission marked the end of his scout plane, but in fact, this particular aircraft would eventually make it back to Haruna. Superb airmanship allowed the pilot to escape repeated attacks. However, his observer was killed, and the Type 95 would never fly again. Had he known it, Yamaguchi had already lost another of his scout planes. Fate had finally caught up to Chikuma No. 5, which had been poking around the edges of the American formations all morning. Petty Officer First Class Takizaki's bird had worked itself all the way around to the south of Task Force 16, scooting in and out of cloud cover when threatened by American fighters. At 2.09pm, however, Takizaki had been caught dead to rights by a pair of wildcats. A single pass was all it took to shoot the E-1301 to pieces. As the American fighters turned for a second run, the float plane exploded. One of the crew members was seen bailing out just before the detonation, but there would be no survivors from this encounter. Back on the home front, Yamaguchi was having his own problems with scout aircraft, both his own and those of the American variety. First, at 1.55pm, Nagumo received a transmission from one of Haruna's planes, which one we do not know, stating, at 12.40pm, the enemy was in position bearing about 90 degrees to port. It is composed of five large cruisers and five carriers. The latter were burning. However, Nagumo apparently retained some scepticism about the report, placing a question mark alongside the number five in his war diary. His next sighting of the enemy, however, was more concrete. At 2.20pm, Chikuma suddenly laid smoke, 
and began blazing away at what it thought was a pair of American aircraft. Her sister ship Tone followed suit ten minutes later, and Hiryu's combat air patrol fighters quickly made tracks toward the intruders. The enemy interlopers beat a hasty retreat shortly thereafter. As it developed, the intruders were from Yorktown. It will be recalled that several hours earlier, at 11.30am, she had sent up ten Scout Bomber Douglas Scouts from Scout Squadron 5. Their mission was to follow up on the success of the morning's dive bomber attacks and determine if any other Japanese carriers were still lurking in the area. One of these sections, led by Lieutenant Sam Adams, had pushed its flight to the limit, further even than his original orders had called for. At 2.30pm on the return leg, Lieutenant Adams's persistence was rewarded when he spotted wakes. Thus, even as Tamonaga was preparing to attack Yorktown, the curtain on Hiryu's temporary immunity was being rung down. Lieutenant Adams had promptly gotten off a plain language spotting report that placed the lone Japanese carrier bearing 279 degrees and some 110 miles from his point of origin, that is, Yorktown's 11.30am launch position, at 31 degrees 15 minutes north, 179 degrees 5 minutes west. His navigation was a little off. He placed Hiryu 38 miles westerly of where she actually was, but his was one of the better American spotting reports of the day. Adams correctly noted that the Japanese were operating in two groups, with the carrier in one and a surface group in advance of it. As it happened, Adams spied Kido Butai when Nagumo's force was still in the lead of Yamaguchi's carrier. With Adams's sighting, the fruits of Yamaguchi's decision to press northeast were beginning to be harvested. Had Kido Butai turned northwest immediately after launching Tomonaga at 1.30 p.m., Hiryu would have been almost 35 miles further west by 2.30 p.m. This would have made Adams's detection almost impossible. The American scout bomber Douglas had been at the limits of their range, as it was shortly after Adams's retreat, the two Japanese forces were reintegrated. Nagumo promptly reorganised his formation with Hiryu at the heart of a box pattern of the force's heavy ships, still heading 045. Battleship Division 3s took up the port flank in column, at a distance of 10 kilometres from the carrier. Cruiser Division 8's Tone and Chikuma guarded the starboard flank of Hiryu at a similar distance. Flagship Nagara took the van ahead of Hiryu, as usual while the five remaining destroyers moved into picket positions in a loose circle around the formation as a whole. In the midst of Nagumo's reorganisation, Tomonaga's attack group came back on the air. It was Lieutenant Hashimoto, the second Chutai leader, announcing, I carried out torpedo attacks against an enemy carrier and saw two certain hits. Yamaguchi and his staff were elated. Two hits were almost certainly enough to put any carrier out of commission. Yet, even before Hashimoto made his report, Yamaguchi was already thinking ahead to future operations. Seeing that Hiryu was already scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of air power, Carrier Division 2's commander was casting about for any additional air power he could find. At 2.30pm he had radioed destroyer Noaki, ordering her to relay to Akagi that if the flagship had any aircraft on deck, they should take off at once and transfer to Hiryu. It may be that Yamaguchi was aware that Akagi had once again managed to get underway and was hopeful that she might yet be made operational. It was a fool's hope. By 2.30pm, Akagi no longer had any intact aircraft on board, let alone a flight deck worthy of the name. Kido Butai's former flagship was, in fact, lying motionless once again beneath an enormous column of oily smoke. Her engines, which had propelled her in a stately clockwise circle for nearly two hours, had finally shut down again at 1.50pm. It may well have been that whatever damage control personnel who had flooded her aft magazines, and presumably restarted her engines as well, had either withdrawn again or been overwhelmed. Alternately, the flagship's boilers, apparently long since untended, may have finally lost steam pressure. Whatever the reason, Akagi was once again stationary, except for the long, slow rhythm of the swells lapping against her sides, the grim struggle against her fires, though ground on relentlessly. To use damage control parlance, 
Both hangar decks and the decks immediately beneath them were still fully involved, meaning they were completely afire. Akagi's crew, though, was not giving up and continued putting firefighting parties into the fray, trying to make their way aft. It would appear that in some areas at least progress was being made. At 2.50pm contact was temporarily re-established with the survivors clustered on the stern and would be again intermittently over the next few hours. On both Akagi and Kaga, the medical staffs, or what was left of them, were faced with a horrendous task. Gathered on the weather decks fore and aft with the other survivors, they were plying their trade with whatever was at hand. The results can only have been pitiable. The survivors were suffering from a variety of injuries, the most prevalent being burns and shrapnel injuries. There was no way to treat these wounds beyond the most basic bandaging and splints. Deep penetration wounds would have likely killed their recipients relatively quickly through loss of blood. The burn victims, however, lingered in agony. In some cases, the badly injured intentionally made their way back into the hangar fires to die there, rather than suffer further. As the day wore on, the initial patient load was steadily augmented by wounded firefighters bearing similar wounds. However, there were new types of cases as well, smoke inhalation, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Smoke inhalation would have been very common within the closed spaces of the carrier as men battled the blazes. 